All right, it's Brian. I'm back for the second part of the optics story, and that's going to be the ray model. And that's the idea that we can like draw an arrow and say, okay, light just travels in this direction. We can think about the path that it travels in. It's a model, but it's an instructive one. And we're going to get to that later today. But first, certain things that light we're going to think again about this whole idea of thin film interference. We talked about it at the end of the class last time, but it's really interesting. It's the kind of thing that gives the colors to soap bubbles. What we're seeing here with the reflection from the soap bubble is that certain colors get canceled, certain colors get reinforced. And so as a consequence, when I have a reflection from a thin film, I have the capability to have these really, really interesting colors. Now, remember, we had this idea that light comes in, and if I have a film, which is on the surface of like, let's say glass, and that's something you're going to look at in the lab. In the lab, you're going to be interested in exploring the idea about, could I put a thin film on the surface of glass to limit reflection? And in fact, you can. Okay, so I put a thin film here. I get a reflection from the first place the ray enters. I get a reflection at this surface, at the air film interface, but I also get a reflection at the film glass interface. And so I have two reflections, and I can have constructive or destructive interference between those two reflections. And we've seen that we have these conditions for constructive or destructive interference, and it depends upon the number of reflective phase changes we have. And that's something I want you to think about in the lab this week. That's something I really want you to spend some time thinking about. Do we get reflective phase changes? If so, how many? And that will inform which one of these relationships you want to use for constructive or destructive interference. And interference colors, you've seen them before. You've seen like pictures of like, oh, here's an oil slick on a road surface and you get a thin film of oil and you get those colors, but it's also responsible for the colors in hummingbirds and other places in nature. And it's responsible for anti-reflection coatings. If you look at these two lenses, this one here, no coating, significant reflection. This one has a coating and it reduces the reflection, but it also has a certain color associated with it. And you've seen this before with glasses as well as camera lenses. You can minimize reflection, but you, if you minimize reflection at one wavelength, you can't minimize it at, all, at other wavelengths. You just have to pick one. You have to pick one. And if you have a piece of glass which has a film on it, you can limit, you, in this case, I'm getting some reflection. In this case, I'm minimizing the reflection. And I do that because I've got a reflection from the two surfaces of the film, and that's going to minimize your reflection. And I need two reflections. <coughs> and the two reflections mean I can have destructive interference. You can also arrange the coating so that it doesn't minimize reflection, but it enhances reflection. And that's what happens in the tapetum, as we saw at the end of the class last time. I actually use this principle to kind of like look for things in the garden. So I've got this headlight. And of course, where should you wear a headlight? But of course, on your head. And I have a headlight on the top of my, of my uh, bike helmet. And then no matter which crazy non-traditional wheel vehicle I'm riding, I always have a nice bright headlamp on top of my head. But the headlight itself is actually quite close to my eyes. So the light is here, my eyes are there. And that's important because then when I'm wearing the headlight and I go out into my garden, I can see the reflection from my eyes of animals that have a tapetum in the back of their eye. And we talked about the tapetum last time. And it turns out when light comes in, to the eye of a creature that has a tapetum, when it comes back out, it comes back exactly the direction that it came in at. So my headlamp is right on top of my head, and so it's the light is very near my eyes. So as a consequence, when I'm wearing my headlight, I will see um, the reflection of animals with a tapetum, and it's really kind of fascinating. Cats have them, raccoons have them, spiders have them, which is kind of awesome. And it allows you to spot them by what's called their eye shine. And I have a little supplementary video, and I think it's actually called Kitty in the Garden. And I would typically show it in class at this time. I want you to go ahead and take a look at that video. And that's kind of like me, I'm in my back garden with my headlight on. I just came home from work and I'm parking my bike and I'm, I, I pan the, the headlight around and I saw this little kitty. And I can show if I take the light and I take it off my head and I put it to the side, I get a reflection from the front of the eye. And you can see that, but I don't get the eye shine. 
And the same idea is true if you have a camera with a lens here, and if the flash is here, you are going to get red eye. You're going to get a reflection from the back of people's retinas. And for people, it's not so bright and it appears red. You've seen this before in photos. With this camera, what you can do is you can unscrew the camera flash and you can take it and you can put it over here. And if we put the camera flash over there, hold it off to the side, then I get a lot less red eye in my photos. If we look at animals that have eye shine, it is no surprise. If we look at different animals, at the bush baby is number one in this category because they're active at night. They are nocturnal. And so as a consequence, their vision has to be really, really good. And so they've got this phenomenal eye shine um, that, you, that you can see. And they've got this well-developed tapetum. Now I want to look at reflection gradings again. And we talked about that idea last time. We talked about the indigo snake. But I want to look at ground beetles, and there's a particular kind of beetles, and this is a picture of the back of a beetle, and you can see there's light um, coming in, and I get a direct reflection right here. But on these two patches, these are rainbows. These are reflections, but they also have a diffraction. They have the blue, the closest to the center, red, the furthest out. This is a diffraction pattern, and the diffraction pattern comes from lines on the beetle's exoskeleton that look like this. And the spacing of the grating, we can see it's probably like a couple of microns. And I got these lines that run like so, and they produce a diffraction effect like we're seeing in this picture right here. And it's indicative of which particular kind of beetle you're looking at. So you can use this to help tell you, what is this beetle before me? Here's another situation where we have that. Here's light shining on a beetle and I get m equals zero, just my direct reflection. I get a rainbow for m equals one, I get a rainbow for m equals two, and m equals three. I get multiple orders of this diffraction. And this is a picture of the structure that produces, produces it on this particular beetle. Now suppose you are out in the field and you're picking up beetles and you're using them to you know, you're kind of like trying to figure out what you have here. One thing you can do, and investigators actually do this, you can shine a light at the beetle and you can look at the diffraction. And this was data I actually got from a research paper. And the people were looking at this particular ground beetle. And for light of 570 nanometers, there were clear maxima at 13 and 25 degrees. And the question I'm, asked, I'm asking you is this, what is the spacing of the lines in the exocuticle that produces that diffraction effect? And there's some steps they want you to go through. You're going to use the equation for diffraction gradients. We know this is a diffraction thing. And then you have to make sense of what the problem is stating. Why are there two angles? What are you solving for in this problem? Think about that. And then I want you to solve away. So I want you to t take a moment, pause the video, and get started on this problem. I'll be back. Now, another thing I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a picture. As you know, I do love pictures. So I have yellow light with 570 nanometers, and it comes in like so. And then I'm going to get clear diffraction maxima at a couple of angles. And what you're going to get is one maximum is going to be at m equals 1, and the next one is going to be at m is equal to 2. And so I've actually got two different problems. I can solve a problem for the spacing of the lines for 13 degrees and for 25 degrees. And I can take those two results and I can average them um, to get my best final results. I'm going to use my basic relationship for diffraction. It's this d times the sine of theta is equal to m times lambda. And let's think about what the different numbers correspond to. d is the spacing. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm trying to find. Theta is actually theta m. I have got two different values for it. One value I have for it is 12 degrees. The other, I'm sorry, 13 degrees. The other angle I have for it is 25 degrees. So I've got two different angles, and those correspond to respe respectively m is equal to 1 and m is equal to 2. Th lambda is the angle, or is the wavelength of light. We're given that that's 570 nanometers. We're told that. With all that information in hand, it's just a simple matter of calculation for 
I my two different cases. For 13 degrees, m is equal to 1, and 25 degrees, m is equal to 2, I can calculate a value for what d is. And if I complete this calculation, I get two different uh, values for d. For m is equal to 1, I get a value of d is equal to 2.5 microns. <clears throat> and for m equals 3, my second value, I get a value of d is equal to 2.7 microns. So if I'm giving my best value for what the spacing d actually is, I'm going to do an average of those two and say it's 2.6 microns. And thinking back to the slide that we saw previously, we looked at the spacing of the lines and we said, based on the micrograph, it seemed like it was a couple of microns. My assessment is that is exactly what we calculated. So everything is good. Next piece of the puzzle, I want to look at this. If you have light going through a slit, it makes a diffraction pattern. But if I have light going through a circular aperture, and this is representing that, I also get this circular diffraction pattern that I see right here. And it turns out that the width of the central ring of this pattern right here, this is approximately equal to 2.44 times lambda times the distance from the aperture to the screen divided by d, where d is the diameter of the aperture. This is circular aperture diffraction. This is going to be an important thing for us. And I'll tell you why. When you look at the world, you are looking at light that comes through a circular aperture. And so as a consequence, the images that appear on your retina are going to have some diffraction pattern associated with it. And that is important. And it's important for this idea of resolution. If I'm looking at two distant point light sources, and I'm trying to see, are these two separate light sources, or are these a single light source? It depends upon the resolution of the optical system. Now, whenever you look at a point light and you use a camera or you use your eye or you use anything with an aperture in the front to make an image of it, you end up getting this fuzzy patch. You're going to end up getting this like fuzzy central patch and then dimmer rings around it. But we'll just focus on the size of that central patch. And if I change the size of the optical system, if I take the aperture and I make it smaller, what ends up happening is the fuzzy patch gets bigger. And if the fuzzy patch is this big, I can just resolve these two. I can tell these two are separate. But if the aperture gets even smaller, the fuzzy patches get even bigger and now they overlap. And so if the aperture is too small, I don't get sufficient resolution to be able to resolve things. This is a problem with your camera phone. Your camera phone has a little itty bitty aperture. And so no matter how good your camera is, you will never get images that match those taken off a legit camera with a big aperture on the front because of diffraction effects. You are limited by the wavelength of light. You're trying to make your camera smaller and smaller and smaller, but the fuzziness is proportional to the wavelength divided by the diameter of the aperture and you are handed this number. That is something the universe gives us and so if this number gets smaller and smaller and smaller our fuzziness just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and there's not a doggone thing you can do about it so you will be able to get decent images with your camera phone but not as good as the ones I take with my actual camera and I'm old school. I carry a camera around. Now we talked about the idea that this was important for your eye. Okay, when light comes into your eye, it goes through some sort of an aperture. That's your pupil. And D is the diameter of the pupil. Okay, and that's about three millimeters for like a typical light level, okay? And the aperture, your pupil, is some distance from your retina, and that distance is about 0.017 meters. We'll talk about that a lot in chapter 19. And if I'm talking about a typical wavelength of light, let's take 450 nanometers. That's in the blue-green part of the spectrum. That's a typical wavelength you would be able to want to see. And remember, our relationship for diffraction was approximately this. This is the width of the spot that is produced by diffraction. So when you're looking at a distant point object, the image that forms on your retina, you would like it to be just a really crisp spot, but that will be a fuzzy dot and it will have a certain size and the width of that fuzzy patch is gonna be given by this relationship right here. So if you look at a distant point light source, what is the width of the spot on your retina? I want you to go ahead and take a moment to calculate this. I'll be back.
If you take that calculation all the way through, what you're going to see is you're going to get the width of the spot is about 6 microns. So if I take this and overlay it on your retina, it's a spot that covers several cones because a typical spacing in your fovea, the place where your cones are packed the tightest, is about 2.5 microns. And so I end up getting a width of this fuzzy spot on your retina that's about six microns. And it turns out there's just no need. And it turns out there's just no need to make the spacing on your retina any closer than about 2.5 microns because of the size of your pupil. Given the size of your pupil, anything better is not going to be helpful. Now the next piece of the puzzle I want to look at is the idea of bending light. And I want you to just take a look at this picture and think about what you're seeing. Think about the colors. This is a really, really cool artistic image. And you can see the light is being bent as it's passing through these glasses in the front, which have clear liquid in them. And bending light we call refraction. And that's the first example of something which we're going to treat by using this ray model of light. Now, I'm going to define this thing called the index of refraction, and we actually used numbers for it last time because you'd read about it in the textbook, but I want you to, to know this about the index of refraction. It's the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light in a material, or if I write it this way, I can also say the speed of light in the material is equal to the speed of light in the vacuum divided by the index of refraction. So the higher the index of refraction is, the slower that light travels in a medium. So you can see light travels at the speed of light in a vacuum, in air ever so slightly less, in diamond quite a bit less, actually it travels quite a bit more slowly. So C is the speed of light, but it's the speed of light in a vacuum. It turns out light actually travels slower than the speed of light because that's defined only for the vacuum. And this index number is gonna be really, really important thing for us. Now, one of the things that we'll look at is this. Different colors of light actually have different indices of refraction. So when light comes into an optical fiber, and you know that all your telecommunications these days are transmitted via light over fibers. So your phone, your internet, everything, it's transmitted through optical fibers. Pulses of light carry the information. And one big problem with that is you have this dispersion, and it turns out that the index of refraction for red light is less than the index of refraction for blue light. That is typically true. Now one thing that that does is it gives us rainbows, and we'll talk about that on, on the next lecture, which is delightful because I'm a huge, huge fan of rainbows. But it causes this dispersion in the optical fiber. So if I put light in the optical fiber, which light gets to the end the first, the red light or the blue light? Take a second to cogitate. I'll be back. Well, the speed of light in a medium is given by the speed of light in a vacuum divided by the index of refraction. So if I have a bigger index of refraction for the blue, it's bigger. That means the speed is slower. So the red light gets there first and the blue light gets there second. As I say, that is actually a real problem. But we're going to be interested in changing index of refraction for something else. And that's this. When light enters, goes from one medium into another, and suppose I have light of wavelength 500 nanometers and it's in air, and it enters a glass block with index of refraction of 1.5. Here's a question. Which of the properties do not change? Take a minute and think about that. I'll be back. Well, we know that the speed changes. The speed has to change um, because we, we're told that the speed of light is equal to C over N, where N is the index of refraction. But there's some things that can't change, and it turns out the frequency can't change. And one way to understand that is this. The photon energy is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency, and I have to conserve energy. So if the energy can't change, the frequency can't change. The frequency of the light stays the same. And if the speed changes and the frequency can't change, it's true that the wavelength must change. The wavelength must change. And something else that doesn't change is the color because color is basically determined by frequency because it's determined by the photon energy. So the color doesn't change. The frequency doesn't change. The speed and the wavelength both do. 
and since the speed changes, and since we have this basic re wave relationship, that the speed of a wave is equal to the frequency times the wavelength, if the speed changes, one of the frequency of the wavelength must change. And in the case of light, if the speed changes, it's the wavelength that changes as well. Now, here's the really, really cool thing that's true about this changing index. If I have a light going from one medium into another, the fact that the speed changes makes the light bend. And actually, I could derive that for you. If mathematically, it's actually pretty easy to understand. The Greeks actually kind of like understood mathematically how this happened to a pretty good degree. But let's not worry about that. Let's just think about the phenomenon. It turns out light will bend. And I want to show you some conventions that we use. Here's the boundary between two different media. I have medium one and medium two. I draw this normal. This is a line that is perpendicular to the interface between the two media. And I measure angles with respect to the normal. So if I have a ray of light coming in like so, I measure the angle of that ray of light with respect to the normal. That's theta one, that's my incident angle. Then I have my angle inside the second medium and I have my angle theta two for it. Again, it's measured with respect to the normal. And the relationship between the two angles and the two indices of refraction are this relationship right here. And this is something known as Snell's law. This is known as Snell's law. And this is gonna be a really important thing for us. Now let's take a look at a, at a, a kind of a problem you could solve with this. So here we go, four meter wide swimming pool is filled to the top. The bottom of the pool becomes completely shaded in the afternoon when the sun is 20 degrees above the horizon. Question, how deep is the pool? I love this question because this is kind of one of those abstracting weird questions that we're fond of asking in physics books. How deep is the pool? Why don't you just jump in and test it? Or why don't you ask the person who owns the pool? Never mind. we're gonna do it this way, this indirect way. So let's go ahead and do that. And it's just an illustrative exercise. I want you to think about how you would solve this problem. Take a moment to think about it. I'll be back. And the way we'll start is by drawing a picture. So here's the swimming pool and it's four meters wide. It's got a certain depth to it. Then rays of light are coming in and they're coming in there 20 degrees above the horizon. So here's a ray of light like so, and the angle above the horizon is 20 degrees. And here's water in the pool. And so the ray of light goes from the air into water. And since it's going from air into water, water is more dense and has a higher index of refraction. And so the light bends away from the normal. And if I draw the normal here, the incident angle when the light comes in is 70 degrees. That's the angle we use in Snell's law. So the light bends and it's going to bend so that the bottom of the pool is completely shaded. And what that means is I'm gonna draw a ray of light and it just hits at the far corner. Now, if I know this angle here is 70 degrees and I know the index of refraction of air, air has an index of refraction of one, water has an index of refraction of 1.33. When light goes from air into water, it bends to a smaller angle, starts out at 70 degrees, ends up at an angle of theta two. We don't know what theta two is, but we can certainly use Snell's law to calculate. But this is how we set up the problem. We draw a picture and with that picture in mind, we can now use this relationship to solve for the angle theta two. Take a minute to puzzle that one out. I'll be back. Well, theta one is the angle in air, and, and we were told that's just 70 degrees. N one is the index of refraction in the first medium, that's air, that's one. N two is the index of refraction in the second medium, that's water, that's 1.33. And what I'm looking for is theta Two. And with all that information in hand, I can calculate theta two. And if I do it, I get theta two is equal to 45 degrees. But the question didn't ask for the angle. It asked for how deep was the pool. Well, you know this. Once we get to this point, let's go ahead and take a look at our picture. So now, instead of having this just be theta two, we know that that angle is, in fact, 45 degrees. We're told that the pool is four meters wide. 
And if that's a 45 degree angle, how deep is the pool? It's four meters deep. And if you have a pool that's four meters wide and four meters deep, that's a really weird, really super deep swimming pool. But what the heck? This is an abstract kind of like starter problem. So we're not going to worry too much about that. But that's how you would solve that sort of problem. We'd follow these steps right here. These are the steps that we went through. Draw a picture, what are the relevant angles, solve for the angle in the pool, solve for the depth, and Bob's your uncle. Now I wanna talk about images, and particularly locating images. So if I look at this fish tank here, and I can see this rock, Let's get a color that shows it better. This rock right here is basically the same as this rock. This piece of whatever it is, is the same as this piece right here. I get double images. That's something we're gonna come back and talk about later. But how do I locate images? How do I tell where something is? Well, this gets us into the ray model. We've used the ray model when we're talking about refraction. Rays of, we drew rays of light, and you can see that we did that. And we're gonna use rays of light to locate images. And here's an example of that. Here's a person reaching into this fish tank through the side, and so the hand is in the water. And you can see it looks like the hand has been kind of like chopped off, so it could be some clever device to kind of like harvest people's hands for feeding the fish, but that would be too dark and disturbing. That's not what's happening. What's happening is the image of the hand is actually clearly in a different place than the hand itself. Um, and so the image and the, where the hand actually is are two different places. That's going to be an important consideration for us. So here's a question. If you're this heron, and the heron is looking at a fish that's 10, degrees, 10 centimeters below the surface of the water, does the fish appear to be at a greater or a shallower depth? I want to think about that. And what we're going to do is we're going to start by drawing a picture. Okay? Now here's the surface of the water. And let's draw a little fishy under the surface. So here's my little fishy right here underneath the surface. And then the heron is looking from up here. And I'm going to draw like here's the eye of the heron kind of like looking down. And I'm going to locate the position of the image by drawing rays of light. Okay. And that's typically what we're going to do. So light comes from the fish. And I'm going to draw rays of light that represent the light reflecting off the fish. Here's a ray of light coming towards the surface of the water. It hits the surface of the water and it bends. Here's a question for you. Does it bend to a bigger angle or does it bend to a smaller angle? It's going from water, which has an index of refraction of 1.33, into air, which has an index of refraction of 1. Bigger or smaller angle? Take a second to think. I'll be back. Well, when you're going from a higher index to a lower index, you were going to bend to a bigger angle. So here's the angle in the water. When it bends in the air, it's going to end up at a bigger angle. And any ray of light I draw coming from the fish is going to do this. So here's a second one. And when it hits the surface, it's going to bend so that it is at a larger angle, like so. But then what the heron does is this, the heron's going to trace the rays of light back and see where do they appear to come from. If I take this ray right here and I trace it back, it looks like it comes from here. And if I take this ray and I trace it back, it looks like it appears to come from there. So the fish appears to be right there and it appears to be at a shallower depth. It appears to be at a shallower depth. And this is something that's important to us. And in the textbook, we talk about this as the apparent depth. If something is underneath the surface of the water, it's going to appear to be at a lower, it's going to appear, appear to be closer to you. And you've seen this before. If you've been walking in kind of like knee deep water and you look at your feet, your feet appear to be too close to you. It's kind of an interesting illusion. Here's another way we can see this. If something is actually closer to you, it appears bigger. And the reason that it appears bigger is just fills up more of your field of view. So here's like a cloud, which is quite large, and a spray can. And this person has done this very cleverly constructed photograph. And so it looks like a tiny, tiny little cloud. It's actually a gigantic cloud, but it's really, really far away. Here's a picture from 
the textbook where we took a ruler and we stuck it into some water in a fish tank and the actual image of the ruler appears to be closer than the actual ruler which is the object and so as a consequence it just appears bigger it appears it appears magnified it appears magnified and that's the apparent depth and that's one way that you can see it now I want you to try this calculation. Suppose a ray of light is passing from under the surface of the water, which has index of refraction of 1.33, into the air as shown. And I want to ask you this question. What is the angle in the air? I want you to take a couple minutes and you want you to honest to goodness go through the calculation and see what you get. Take a minute. I'll be back. Okay, you little scamp, you know what you've done is you've just waited for me to kind of like say to start talking and tell you the answer. Not so fast this time, you little scampy scamp. I want you to go and actually do this calculation. How do we set it up? How do we solve? What do you get for theta? Now, when you did that, you might have seen that your calculator gave you an error message. And we can see why. Here's my basic relationship. N1 sine theta 1 is equal to N2 sine theta 2. Let's take medium 1 is the water. Medium 2 is the air. N1 is 1.33. Sine theta 1 is the sine of this angle right here, which is 50 degrees. N2 is the index of refraction of water, which is 1, and I'm looking for theta 2. But if I take 1.33 times the sine of 50 degrees, I get something which is bigger than 1. So if this number, and I can't have a situation where 1 times the sine of theta 2 is bigger than 1 because the sine of any angle is always less than or equal to 1. So this is a problem that doesn't have any solution. So as a consequence, if a ray of light is coming in water and hits the boundary between water and air at an angle of 50 degrees, it does not leave. What it does is it reflects from the boundary. None of it is refracted. All of it is reflected. And so we have a situation like this where it looks like the water is going from the water into the air. It can't happen. It ends up just being reflected like so. This is a phenomenon known as total internal reflection. And this is kind of a really crucial concept for us. And the critical angle above which you will only have total internal reflection is given by this relationship right here. That's the critical angle, and it depends upon the index of refraction of the two media. Although for our purposes, N2 is always going to be air, so that's going to be 1. And then this is the index of refraction of the medium. And I want you to pause right now, and I want you to look at a video. And this is a video that's actually in the textbook. It's one of our figure videos. But it's a video on total internal reflection because I want you to understand actually how it works. So I want you to pause. I want you to take a look at a video on total internal reflection and kind of like see how that works. Now, if we calculate the, to the critical angle for different substances, we're going to see an interesting trend. The higher the index of refraction is, the smaller the critical angle is. I want you to do a quick calculation for these substances and see what you get. And if you do this, you see the angle gets successively smaller and smaller and smaller until you get to diamond. And for diamond, I get a, a critical angle that's about 24 degrees. What that means is when light is inside a diamond, it's quite likely to just reflect from the inside surface and bounce around. And that's why diamonds have a high index of refraction. They also have a high coefficient of sparkliness. That's what gives gems their sparkle, is the light gets inside and it reflects around a lot before it comes back out. And they cut, the traditional cut of a diamond is designed to enhance that. There's a little window at the top where the light can get in and it reflects off the facets and reflects around inside and gets sent back out the top. 
Now I want you to think about this. Suppose I have light which is passing into a tank of water with n is equal to 1.33 as shown. What is the angle in the water? I want you to do a quick calculation for that. Go ahead and take a moment, complete that calculation. I'll be back. What we'll get, of course, let's just do this. My index, my medium one is air, medium two is my water, because I'm going from the air into the water. So the index of refraction of medium one is one. In medium two, it's 1.33. Theta one is 80 degrees. And theta two, that's what I'm trying to solve for. And if I do my calculation and I solve for what theta two is, I get an angle of about 40 Eight degrees and actually it turns out if I took this to be 89.999 degrees I would get something very very similar so when light comes in at a very glancing angle to the surface of the water it's going to be coming in at some angle relative to the normal that is not that large and this produces an interesting optical effect if you're under the water and you're looking up Here's a picture that someone has made. They got in the water with their camera and they went to the bottom. They're on the bottom, they're holding their breath, not making any waves, and you can see if they're looking upward, they see a circle of light. Here is the light that came from above. The rest outside that circle, which is at a bigger angle, is just a reflection of the bottom of the pool. So this is reflected light. This is the light that came in, and all the light from above has to be squeezed into that smaller, small circle with an angle of 48 degrees or less. This is something that's known as Snell's window, and you can see this. Here's a picture, scuba diver down underneath the water taking a picture upward of a turtle, and then we've got this circle of light right here that the light that comes from above and the rest you're seeing the reflection from down below but there's not very much light down there so it appears quite dark and it's a fascinating phenomenon if you're ever deep in the ocean and look up you'll see that now i want you to think about this issue right here so i have a ray of light and there's a glass prism as shown and i want you to use what you know about the bending of light at the boundary between the air and the glass and then glass and the air to trace the path of the light as it traverses the prism and i actually want you to take this i want you to draw it out i want you to use a ruler and a pencil and i want you to tell me what path the ray is actually going to take take a few minutes to do that i'll be back Now, in fact, I know that you haven't actually gone ahead and done that, but I actually want you to do it. I want you to pause and I want you to do this. I want you to say, okay, here's the first place where the ray of light enters, right here. I'm going to draw a normal to the surface. And I'm going to think about how does the ray of light bend. Ooh, that's a terrible looking normal. Let's back that up. I tell you, my artistic abilities leave a lot to be desired. So I'm going to draw a perpendicular to the surface like so. That's my normal. I want you to think about how the ray bends and then think about its subsequent path. Complete that diagram. I'll be back. Now when the light goes from air into glass, it goes from an angle theta 1 to an angle theta 2 that's smaller. So I need an angle inside the glass that is smaller. And I'm going to draw it like this. There's my theta 2 that is smaller. When it comes out the other side, this angle on the other side is now going to be theta 1. And then it's going to go to a bigger angle when it traverses the other side. And so it's going to end up at an angle like so. There's my angle on the opposite side. And as I've drawn it with the prism about like I've drawn it, that is about how the ray of light is going to go. And as a matter of fact, most people tend to be familiar with that. And that's what they would typically guess because there's this very iconic image that you have seen before. But before we get to that, I'm going to bring up 
a concept known as dispersion. I mentioned earlier the idea that the index of refraction varies with wavelength, and typically the index of refraction is smaller for smaller wavelengths, and it's more for shorter wavelengths. So as a consequence, when light gets bent by a prism, the blue light gets bent by more than the red light, and so as a consequence, you have a rainbow appearing because I'm gonna separate the different colors of light. And the reason, when I give that problem to students where I have the ray of light coming into a prism, draw the subsequent path that people are familiar with it is because everybody has seen this picture right here and of course this is from Pink Floyd and this is really how it would work ray of light comes into a prism and when it goes through it's going to get refracted and different colors are going to be bent by more and the rays of light of the short wavelengths here at the bottom bend more than the long wavelengths which are at the top everybody has seen this image before and I want you to notice something in this picture I see one two three four, five, six colors in the rainbow. And I want you to think about that because you have also been told that the rainbow colors are Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Isaac Newton says there are seven colors in the rainbow. Pink Floyd says there's six. Isaac Newton, in his original publication, says purple, well, it's violet. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, purple or violet. He says seven colors. Floyd says six. Newton says seven. Who is in fact correct? This is a really, really, really fascinating story. And, and, and there's a point to it. And it's the point that I'll talk about next time. When I talk about how many colors are there in the rainbow? Smackdown, Pink Floyd versus Isaac Newton. I'll see you then.